I think we'll get started here while our um, guest speaker uh, finishes his last uh, few bites of sugar charge uh, to, before he comes up here. Uh, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, each and every one of you uh, for coming this evening and, and uh, helping us you know, with this series of, of, of lectures that we've been doing. This is great. Look at, let's look around. Every seat is filled. It's fantastic. What a, what a, what a great group. Thank you so much. Um, the, the Provost Distinguished Lecture Series is something that, that you know, I thought about doing when I stepped in as Provost two and a half years ago. I'm not Provost anymore, in case you don't know. But, but uh, when I stepped in, I thought we would do something like this because I thought it was really, really important for us to bring in thought leaders to ASU. And I meant thought leaders who are thinking about big things, not simply thinking about science and engineering and technology. I, I mean, I think that's really important, but often we get caught up in that and that's more tinkering. I mean, people who are thinking, the, thinking outside the box, but particularly I was interested in in setting up a series where we brought in outstanding international figures who met at the intersection of the humanities, the social sciences, and the natural and physical sciences. This, this interface, I think, is really what universities are all about. You know, in scientists, you know, we go out and we gather data and whatnot. Uh, we think that we're addressing world problems or whatever by going out and collecting our data and doing our experiments. But in every single case, it really takes social scientists and takes humanities, humanitarian, what do you call yourself in the humanities? We're all humanitarians, but anyway. Humanists, that's right. It takes humanists to come in and, and, and actually put the meaning to what we do. We, we need to give it the social context, we need to give it the meaning. So looking for people to come in and meet this challenge as distinguished uh, provost uh, lecturers uh, was the challenge. And I think that tonight we have a special case of that. I think we have a case of someone who's truly working and looking at that interface that we've been trying to hit with respect to this, this particular series. So right now what I will do is I will introduce Dr. Mark Lucier, the department chair of the Department of, of English. And he will come up and he will introduce our speaker for the evening. Once again, thank you for coming. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I can't read this without being blind to you, which is uh, probably not news to a few of my students. So, um, so first, uh, please join me again in thanking uh, Rob Page for the lecture series. Uh, he talked about the lecture series. He's also put in place a uh, fellowship program for the humanities as well with at least uh, one recipient uh, uh, that I see before us from last year. Um, and part of his commitment has allowed, has rendered the humanities more visible as an animating presence within the university environment. And I also wanted to thank him for his leadership since uh, leaving California to serve in order as director of Souls School of Life Sciences, uh, the dean of class, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and as university provost. So please. As well, I'm grateful for the support uh, of those that Rob uh, mostly put in place and the Office of the Provost. Uh, most especially, Margaret, or actually, as it turns out, as we know her, Peggy uh, Colum, uh, uh, who uh, has been a, always been a strong supporter of our department and our diverse efforts and interests. Most especially, I want to thank an individual not with us tonight physically, but who is very much in my heart and head. George Justice, Dean of uh, the Humanities and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. George worked in large and small ways to assure uh, the support of the college and the university for this event in spite of daunting complications. And we would not be here this evening without his tireless advocacy of our shared disciplines and our shared concerns. So thanks very much, George. Second, I'm deeply grateful uh, for our collaborators in the School of Sustainability 
and the Wrigley uh, Global Institute of Sustainability, which we all call GEOS as a shorthand. Um, uh, Gary Dirks sits here, uh, directs GEOS, and has often said that, quote, only the humanities can save the planet now. Uh, and also the dean of the School of Sustainability, Christopher, well, I mean, Chris Boone, uh, who, when brought into our planning discussions, committed immediately, quote, to make it happen. Now, let's just make it happen. Uh, uh, and it turns out that if you, and I noticed that many of you were at the program this morning at 10 a.m. in the EMU, um, where uh, Jonathan uh, really conducted, uh, but didn't uh, just address, but actually orchestrated uh, an open forum on how can the humanities save the planet. Now, their openness to collaborations uh, with the humanities and I'm still with uh, GEOS, uh, including bringing a number of us uh, into, their, uh, into their bosom, so to speak, um, as senior sustainability scholars, has been a positive force for humanities, programs, and scholars seeking through skillful means to confront the current crisis, to engage those wicked problems that define global climate change, and to identify the parameters of those conditions that shape planetary entry into the Anthropocene. That term, Anthropocene, emerged as and at the core of a multi-year humanities in the environment work undertaken uh, through a Mellon grant of, to the Institute of, Human Re, uh, of Humanities Research under the steadfast leadership of Sally Kitsch and points to the synergy generated on this pressing issue by the IHR and those with whom I have most worked energetically, Cora Fox, and I, many of you, I, I, I don't see Cora because I don't have my glasses on, as it turns out, uh, and Joni Adams. Third, the number of people in the Department of English who have had a hand in uh, the making of this evening, and actually since um, uh, since Jonathan arrived uh, four days ago, it's uh, the actual the last four days, uh, is, is just, it's, they made it possible and it's just too large a group to list here. Yet I thank all, from professors and graduate students to the large number of staff involved in putting all the pieces in place. However, I did want, actually I really need, uh, to thank a few specific people for their efforts. I thank Kristen LaRue, I know she's uh, been hovering everywhere uh, to take care of us as usual, um, who has actually been our long-term public uh, uh, relations director uh, in the department and who helped coordinate every single logistical element of the talk tonight and this program, on top of the other 50 things that she has to have due by the end of the day tomorrow. As well, I thank Bruce Matsunaga, uh, who is our Director of Digital Technologies uh, and who has offered his uh, time quite liberally, not just for this program, obviously Bruce is here uh, at the camera as usual, um, uh, but he's also going to do an awful lot of work after this is over uh, in solitude, uh, orchestrating and editing the material uh, to make it actually a sort of uh, a, a usable, immediate past for our department. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank uh, two people that aren't here tonight, Lorinda Liggins and Christine Rondo Guardiola. Uh, they're members of our financial team who were responsible for processing everything needed to facilitate such an enterprise and securing the support of, uh, for this particular event and virtually all others uh, that come out of our department. And so thank you one and all to the mission at hand, I suppose. Uh, I'm not long for long, I'm not one for long dirge-like introductions. Uh, and tonight, such a genre, uh, I would argue would be most inappropriate given the spirit that has animated the last 25 years of work commenced and completed by tonight's speaker, Sir Jonathan Bate. Uh, Jonathan is provost of Worcester College, and a professor of English literature uh, at uh, University of Oxford. Uh, he has wide-ranging interests in Shakespeare and the Renaissance, 
uh, romanticism, biography and life writing, echocriticism, contemporary poetry, theater history. Oh, and there was a novel that you happened to write too, uh, uh, squeezed it in in his spare time. Uh, uh, he is extraordinarily productive. Uh, I can't actually, I mean, I've got a long list of all the books. Uh, and uh, you know, just do yourself a favor if you want to look at all of them. I don't have time to list them. Um, uh, but just uh, type in John's name and do a Google search. Uh, you'll have reading for the afternoon at least, or the evening perhaps. Um, however, in my case, uh, as a European romanticist, uh, I simply needed to get out of my desk when I was writing this and wander over to my bookshelf and I picked up the first three books under a rather healthy uh, chunk organized alphabetically uh, under the last name Bait. So I'm going to start with, uh, and actually it turned out that they happen to be in the order in which I encountered them. So, uh, so first, from the introduction to the Romantics on Shakespeare, that is near its conclusion. It is fashionable to be skeptical about the idea that art can provide reconciliation in the face of suffering and death. But it is empirically true that Shakespeare helped the Romantics to endure their coming hither and going hence. And going hence. Uh, one of the things that uh, I found uh, most interesting as I was putting this together is not only did that resonate with the type of connective work that, um, uh, that Professor Bate was doing back then, uh, but it actually continues to this day. Uh, and it came forward in conversations actually in the last two days about his interest in medical humanities. Second, introduction to Romantic ecology, Wordsworth and the environmental tradition. I propose that Romantic ideology is not a theory of imagination and symbol symbolized by self-consciously idealistic and elitist texts, but a theory of ecosystems and unalienated labor embodied in pragmatic and populist texts. Uh, this was the occasion where uh, actually we met for the first time, I think, uh, when I was in graduate school. Uh, and he had come to Texas A&M back in eight, 1989. Um, uh, and we had one of those, uh, I mean, did a, a glorious and powerful program, followed by uh, a relentless amount of conversation with all of my colleagues in a party that just went on forever. It was just more Finally, the third book in that string, and there's more, but I'm just going to, I want to close it off. And that is from the conclusion to the Song of the Earth, which I had the good fortune to review. We are poets. What are poets in our brave new millennium? Could it be to remind the next few generations that it is we who have the power to determine whether the earth will sing or be silent. If mortals dwell in that, and of course his example was Wallace Stevens's The Planet on the Table, uh, they save the planet. And if poetry is the original admission of dwelling, then poetry is the place where we save the planet. It, is, it gives me really great pleasure uh, to present a truly delightful and impactful biographer, broadcaster, critic, novelist, playwright, and primarily, I think, what Rob had in mind for these sorts of talks, a public intellectual, Sir Jonathan. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming out on a Tuesday evening. Uh, huge thanks to my, my, my dear, dear friend, Mark Lucier for inviting me. Uh, thanks to the Emeritus Provost uh, for the honor of delivering a lecture in this series. And thanks to everybody who's helped make a fantastic visit uh, possible. Uh, I last came to Arizona State um, some 20 years ago when you were about half the size you are now. Uh, but the, uh, it's not only the, the scale of your work, but the, the, the extraordinary innovative quality of the interdisciplinary work that is going on here that I, I, I makes it a tremendously exciting place to be. Um, and I, I've, I've had a great time here. Um, I've just published a biography of uh, the former poet laureate of Great Britain, Ted Hughes. Um, 
If uh, you had read any of the reviews of this uh, uh, in the newspapers in Britain, you'd probably have got the impression uh, that it was about two things. One, his relationship with Sylvia Plath and his grief and guilt over her death, and two, Ted Hughes's sex life. Um, it is true that these were things of some significance in his life, and the book does duly dwell upon them. Uh, but actually, there is much else in the book, because Hughes was a writer and thinker um, of extraordinary range and variety. And what I want to do this evening um, is pick out one strand of Hughes's career, his fascination with the environment, with ecology, and with the, the way in which we think about humankind's relationship to our planet, our stories, and also other species. So for those of you who have seen uh, the name Ted Hughes uh, in the title of the lecture and have come along expecting a lot of Sylvia Plath, I'm going to have to disappoint you. Uh, however, I couldn't possibly come to America uh, and talk about Ted Hughes and leave Sylvia Plath out altogether. So I'm going to begin um, with uh, two little, little vignettes, little Plathian vignette, vignettes, um, from uh, the happiest time of their life, which was when they were in America together. Um, you'll remember uh, after they married, after that whirlwind romance in Cambridge, England in 1956, um, Sylvia uh, got a job at her old college at Smith, uh, and in the summer of 1957, uh, they came over to New England. And Ted recorded his first impressions of America in long journal-like letters sent to his parents back in Yorkshire, England, and his brother and sister-in-law in Australia, and his sister Olwyn in Paris. He found that in comparison with dour, confined 1950s England, everything was large, opulent, brash. Even the robins were as big as thrushes, he noted, and sociability was compulsory. Wellesley did, however, seem to, Wellesley, which was where Sylvia Plath's mother, Aurelia, lived, did seem to him rather suburban. So he was delighted when they went down to Cape Cod. Aurelia Plath's wedding present to them was a summer uh, in a rented cottage on Cape Cod. Um, and I had the great pleasure this summer of going and tracking that cottage down. But what he didn't like about America was the way that things were homogenized and packaged. What a place America is, he wrote to his sister, Olwyn. Everything is in cellophane. Everything is 10,000 miles from where it was plucked or made. The bread is in cellophane, which is covered with such slogans as decrapularized, re-energized, multi-cramulated, bleached, double bleached, re-browned, unsanforized, guaranteed, no blaspheming. There is no such thing as bread. You cannot buy bread. So there was Ted Hughes in the summer of 1957, worrying about processed food, worrying about what we now call food miles, food 10,000 miles from where it was made. And in that sense, he was a visionary, prophetic figure, aware before our time of the environmental problems of our time. But of course, what he loved about America when the following summer, he and Sylvia set off on their grand tour and drove um, Warren Plath's old car all the way around the United States. What he loved were the landscapes, uh, particularly those of the West. And there was a wonderful moment when they arrived at the Grand Canyon. Um, by this time, Sylvia was pregnant um, with their daughter Frida, who's become a, a tremendous friend of mine, Frida, who is a, a wonderful artist and poet herself. Um, and as they uh, stood at what Ted called the grandest of all sites, which was, of course, the Grand Canyon, America's Delphi, he called it, the equivalent of Delphi, the, the seat, of, the, the seat of, uh, of power and prophecy in ancient Greece. There they sought a blessing on the baby in Sylvia's womb. Navajo dancers, standing on the rim of the greatest gorge in the world, beat a drum, sounding an echo that in a poem written 30 years later, Ted imagined he could hear faintly in the voice of his own daughter. The blessing on Frida at the Grand Canyon. But 
The aspect of the book that I want to focus on takes us a long way from Sylvia Plath and the tragedy of her death. The question I want to ask is, was Ted Hughes an eco-warrior or an eco-warrior? The eco-warrior speculates and theorises about our environmental crisis and humankind's alienation from nature. The eco-warrior tries to do something about it. Ted Hughes was a poet fascinated by the way that literature and myth and storytelling could explore humankind's relationship to nature. His journey of discovery in that regard began when he went to his, uh, his high school, his, his, his grammar school uh, in 1941 where in the school library he found a book called Tarka the Otter by the writer Henry Williamson. He took it out of the library and kept it for two years until he knew it by heart. It was the first of the talismanic books that shaped his inner life. Williamson's novel, which was published in 1927, had become a bestseller. It was written from the point of view of an otter, yet it was unsentimental and at times it was extremely violent. Uh, perhaps because of its violence and lack of sentimentality, English teachers found it especially good um, to recommend to, to boys. It's always more difficult uh, finding good reading for 11, 12, 13 year old boys than for girls. The combination of adventure, notably an extended hunting sequence, intricately, intricately observed natural history, and a heightened literary style caught Ted Hughes's imagination at a formative moment of his early adolescence. And what impressed him was the otteriness of the book, its rigorous refusal to anthropomorphize the otter. Years later, uh, in a newspaper article uh, about, about the book, he said that Tarka is not one of those little mannequins in an animal's skin who think and talk like men. He was enchanted by that book. It was as if his own life as a boy in the fields and among the animals on the Yorkshire moors above his home had been recreated in a book. It was the seeding of his poetic vocation. Among the set-piece descriptions that grabbed him was one of the great winter, which evoked six black stars and a great white star flickering at their pitches like six peregrines in a Greenland falcon, a dark speck falling, the wish of the grand stoop from 2,000 feet heard half a mile away, red drops on a drift of snow, the moon, white and cold, awaiting the swoop of a new sun, the shock of starry talons to shatter the icicle spirit in a rain of fire. Stories written into the night sky. In the south strode Orion the hunter with Sirius the dog star baying green at his heels. And at midnight, hunter and hound rushing in a bright glacial wind, hunting the false star dwarfs of burnt out suns. Here in embryo are the elements of Ted Hughes's own poetry. The violent forces of nature played out against a cosmic backdrop. Figures of myth, of creation and destruction. Bird of prey, blood on snow, moon, stars, apocalyptic darkness. But there is danger here. Henry Williamson, during the 1930s, felt, he, partly I, I think as a result of his, his terrible experience in the Great War, felt that England was in decline and that a strong need leader was needed. He found such a leader, Henry Williamson, in Adolf Hitler. Williamson attended the Nuremberg Rally in 1935, was inspired by Hitler's charisma. He idolised Oswald Mosley, the, the founder of a leader of the British Union of Fascists, and that would turn him into a pariah in the literary world. Ted Hughes became friends with Henry, Henry Williamson when he, Hughes, moved to Devon where Williamson lived. So he found himself in a difficult position when, on Williamson's death, he was asked to uh, give a memorial address in the Church of St. Martin's in the Field, a uh, very prominent church in London. 
And there, he did not shy away from Williamson's ugly politics. He acknowledged that Williamson's stories of nature read in tooth and claw came from the same impulse as his fascism. That is to say, from a worship of natural energy that led to a fear, a fear close to rage, of inertia, neglect, sloppiness, wasteful exploitation. Hughes said that Henry Williamson's keen feeling for a biological law, the biological struggle against entropy, sprouted into a social and political formation with all its attendant dangers of abstract language. Williamson's worship of natural creativity meant that he rejoiced in anybody who seemed to be able to make positive things happen, anybody who had a practical vision for repairing society, upgrading craftsmanship, nursing and improving the land. This reverence for a natural as opposed to an artificial life led Williamson to imagine a society based on natural law, a society which was hierarchical and with a visionary leader. It's a very similar trajectory to that of um, the writer D.H. Lawrence. Such ideas, said Ted Hughes, had strange bedfellows. Does that, though, mean that the ideas are necessarily wrong? Hughes himself shared William's vision of the, the force of natural creativity and the need to acknowledge the biological law. It all springs, he said, out of a simple poetic insight into the piety of the nat natural world and a passionate concern to take care for it. And in that, he says, Williamson was an eco-warrior before his time, a North American Indian sage among Englishmen. And yet, Hughes also identified that there is a line of correspondence between the green thinking, which cries back to the land, and the black thinking of fascism that cries blood and soil. But Hughes himself was too canny and grounded too suspicious of the abstract language of ideology to make that fatal move which Williamson made from biocentric vision to extreme right-wing politics. Something that perhaps helped Hughes to distance himself from that very masculine, aggressive vision was another book that he discovered. At the end of his school days, he got a place to go up to Cambridge University um, and his teacher gave him, as a parting gift, a present for going up to university, a book by another writer uh, who was much admired in the mid-20th century, Robert Graves, another writer also who, of course, had fought in the First World War. It was Robert Graves' book, The White Goddess, in which Graves surveyed the myths and stories of many different cultures, Eastern and Western, but especially Celtic, and found a common pattern a common story which involved the figure of a white goddess, a female earth goddess, whom he argues in many cultures has been displaced by a male sky god. For Graves, the role of the poet is to be in tune with, to get in touch with the white goddess, who is a version of Gaia, the earth goddess, the goddess of grounding and of place. Graves famously writes in that book, the goddess is a lovely slender woman with a hooked nose, a deathly pale face, lips red as rowan berries, startlingly blue eyes and long fair hair. She will suddenly transform herself into sow, mare, bitch, vixen, she-ass, weasel, serpent, owl, she-wolf, tigress, mermaid. The test of a poet's vision is the accuracy of his portrayal of the white goddess. And again and again in Hughes's poetry, the animal figures of which he writes are manifestations and metamorphoses of this white goddess. Graves argues that all developed cultures eventually destroy their goddess and replace her with a patriarchal sky god. In England, he says, this stage was reached in 
the period of Protestantism and the, uh, the Cromwellian co Commonwealth, when the medieval Catholicism, in which the figure of the Virgin had taken over the rights and honours of the white goddess, was extirpated in the name of Protestantism. Now that idea actually chimed uh, with uh, the tenets uh, of many of the members of the English faculty at Cambridge University where Ted Hughes went up to study. This was the time when F.R. Leavis, uh, under the influence of T.S. Eliot, was arguing in Cambridge that there was what Eliot called a disassociation of sensibility in the mid-17th century during the English Civil War, just after the age of Shakespeare, a fracture in English society where that, that sense of the mythic, the old gods, was once and for all destroyed. If you think about, for example, John Milton's um, uh, Ode on Christ's Nativity, it's very much about the, the, the extermination of those old gods and goddesses of place. So what Hughes tries to do in his poetry is answer to uh, a, an accurate natural historical vision, as Williamson did in Tarka the Otter, but also to, uh, to, to create versions, reversionings of the myth of the white goddess. He's fascinated by the way that ancient forces and energies are restricted by modernity, by civilization, but that they will always come, come, come out, they will always seek to release their bounds. Among his most famous early poems is a poem called The Jaguar, written when he had a, a, a short-time job while he was a student washing dishes in the cafe at London Zoo, uh, and he would look out um, of, of the kitchen and see a jaguar pacing in its cage. But then he imagines the jaguar imagining its freedom, and he sees the poem as a place where a jaguar and perhaps a poet and a reader can be freed from the cage of modernity, can bound towards the horizon. Similarly, his famous poem, Hawk Roosting, is a meditation about power in nature that, in a way, for perhaps uh, alluding to, to Williamson's politics, suggests that by looking at uh, the power, the danger of a hawk, uh, we get a way of thinking about the dangerous power of a dictator, a tyrant, a leader. I want to read uh, a, another of um, the, the, the poems uh, from his, his early career. This was published in Lupercal, uh, his, his second volume, uh, which I think is his, 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 his greatest book. Uh, written at the time when he and Sylvia are working very closely together. Uh, he finished the book when they were, they were on writing fellowships at, at Yaddo. Um, it's a poem called Thrushes, and I think it catches very well um, Hughes's fascination with, uh, if you like, the division between um, the kind of um, wholeness of a natural creature and the dividedness of a thinking human. Thrushes by Ted Hughes. Terrifying are the attempt sleek thrushes on the lawn, more coiled steel than living, a poised dark deadly eye, those delicate legs triggered to stirrings beyond sense, with a start, a bounce, a stab. Overtake the instant and drag out some writhing thing. So this is a thrushes on a lawn, their sharp beaks stabbing down pulling out a worm. No indolent procrastinations and no yawning states, no sighs or head scratchings, nothing but bounce and stab and a ravening second. And then he asks, what is it about a thrush that makes them such effective killers? Is it their single mind sized skulls or a trained body or genius? or a nest full of brats gives their days this bullet and automatic purpose. Mozart's brain had it, and the shark's mouth, that hungers down the blood smell even to a leak of its own side and devouring of itself, efficiency which strikes too streamlined for any doubt to pluck at it or obstruction deflect. So a shark and the brain of Mozart have this instant connected quality of a thrush. 
With a man, with an ordinary man, that is, it is otherwise. Heroisms on horseback, outstripping his desk diary at a broad desk, carving at a tiny ivory ornament for years. His act worships itself, while for him, though he bends to be blent in the prayer, how loud and above what furious spaces of fire do the distracting devils, orgy and hosanna, under what wilderness of black, silent waters weep. It's a complex and difficult poem. I suggest you uh, go, go away and have, a, have, a, have a, a reread of it and a serious think about it. But what he's, what he's talking about here is the, the sense that uh, for the thinking writer, the thinking artist, um, there's always a process of self-consciousness that detaches us from uh, that, that sense of a, a biological impulse, which the thrush, the shark, and the untrammeled genius, Mozart's brain, has. Um, and uh, I think it, it's in a fascination uh, with the way in which the poet can simultaneously be the person who reconnects us to nature and biological process, whilst also constantly acknowledging that as thinking beings, users of reason and users of language, we are always at some level at a distance from, apart from, detached from nature. Hughes explores uh, the, these ideas of connection and detachment in many, many different poetic genres. One of the uh, great joys for me of writing his, his biography, reading the hundred or so books uh, that he wrote and the tens of thousands of pages of manuscripts that he left in the, the two great manuscript uh, collections of his works at Emory uh, University in Atlanta and in the British Library in London, is the way in which uh, he uses different media, different forms of narrative and storytelling uh, to explore some of these great themes. For instance, he writes extensively for the theatre. He also uh, translates um, poetry and drama, uh, because his, his uh, translation of uh, 15 of the stories in Ovid's Metamorphoses, his Tales from Ovid, is what, what was one of the great works of his late career. But he also explored these ideas in the genre of children's literature. Um, and uh, in uh, 1969, which was a very uh, traumatic time in his life, it was the time that his, his second lover, Asia Wevel, killed herself um, and, and indeed killed their daughter, Shura. Um, during that time, um, he published uh, a children's book. He had published a number of children's books before, but this was the one that really uh, seemed to catch the, the, the imagination of, of, of many, many people. It was called The Iron Man, uh, although in America, uh, I think because uh, the title of The Iron Man was sort of, uh, associated uh, with a, a, a particular um, Marvel comic figure, uh, it was called The Iron Giant over here. Um, and indeed, uh, over time, it proved to be Ted Hughes's best-selling and best-loved work, establishing him as one of the world's leading children's authors, as well as one of its most admired poets. The story begins with a giant figure teetering on the edge of a cliff and then tumbling into a mighty fall down to the beach below. Uh, it's interesting, at the, same, at the time that he was doing this, uh, he had just finished working with the great theatre director Peter Brook on an extraordinary um, uh, production of Seneca's Oedipus, and Brook then proposed that Ted Hughes should write him the screenplay for a movie version of King Lear, uh, which, which Brook had, had earlier staged at the Royal Shakespeare Company. In fact, the collaboration didn't work out. Uh, the, the Peter Brook King Lear film with Paul Schofield did eventually appear, but not with the Ted Hughes script. Um, but uh, I think Hughes was thinking about Lear and the, the idea of a, a mighty figure falling from a cliff to a beach is, of course, one of the climactic moments in King Lear. Well, the broken man of iron is then reassembled by seagulls. Uh, they begin by picking up his eyeball, which may be another nod to King Lear. It is a version of something that Hughes had discovered in a book that was of enormous importance for him, um, uh, which was uh, Messier Eliade's book, Shamanism. Uh, 
shamanism, which explores the idea, again, in many, many different shamanic traditions, uh, of a ritual dismemberment of the body and then a renewal of the organs. The Iron Man then starts eating tractors, diggers, and any other farm machinery that is made of iron, not to mention chewing up barbed wire fences, his equivalent of spaghetti. The figure who saves the farmers, the guardians of the land, from this terrifying creature is a boy called Hogarth. We first see Hogarth fishing, and he's very much like the young Ted Hughes, who, who all, all his life was a great fisherman. Or perhaps he's a little bit like the young William Wordsworth. He blows mimic hootings to owls. Um, so what then happens is that the, the, the boy Hogarth sets a trap for a fox and catches the Iron Man instead. And then when the giant re-emerges from the pit in which he's been caught, Hogarth leads him away from the farms to a scrap metal yard. And at that point, a giant space bat angel dragon lands on the earth. Uh, the, I think there's a, something of an influence here, actually, of W. G. G. Uh, of H. G. Wells's um, great, great novel, The War of the Worlds, which uh, Hughes read and enjoyed as a schoolboy. Um, so what then happens is that humankind uh, uh, uses all its assembled military might uh, to try to destroy this monster from the stars, but to no avail. Because we're, we're, we're in 1968-69 here, a time where space flight uh, is all the rage. I mean, Apollo 8 is about to be launched as, as Hughes is writing this. But then the Iron Man saves the day when, out of gratitude to the boy Hogarth, who's led him away from the marauding farmers, he fights on Earth's behalf. He tames the space bat angel into singing the music of the spheres instead of waging cosmic war, with the result that human beings become peaceful, stop making weapons, and live in global harmony. Well, what on earth is this story about? Uh, at one level, given that it's published on the eve of the, pra the Prague Spring, it's a dream of the end of the Cold War. It's an imagined realization of the idealistic goals of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. It's very interesting, uh, I mentioned uh, Sylvia Plath being pregnant with Frieda Hughes. When she, uh, after she gave birth to Frieda uh, in London in 1960, the first time Frieda, Sylvia Plath took Frieda Hughes out, it was on a campaign for nuclear disarmament march. But at a deeper level, the story of the Iron Man gives vivid and compressed form to many of Ted Hughes's key themes. When asked about its meaning, he said that his essential idea was to dramatize the three centers of power. The boy Hogarth embodies the child's nature, the child's sense of himself, that romantic idea of the power, the powerful innocence of the child. The Iron Man, Hughes says, is the giant robot of technology, terrifying and destructive, uncontrollable and inhuman, unless it is approached without fear, but with patience and good sense. You got a wonderfully sort of balanced sense of uh, what our relationship with technology should be. As for the space bat angel dragon, it is, he says, the infinitely mysterious life power that emerges from atoms, the biological psychic mystery of organic being. That latter force is also terrifying and destructive, uncontrollable and inhuman, unless approached without fear. It needs to be approached with firmness, courage, open-mindedness, cunning, and kindness. The story, Hughes says, is a ritual by which the child and these two monstrous entities are brought into a single, inclusive, integrated pattern of behavior and awareness in a shared life that is happy and peaceful. Humankind, technology, biological forces held together in harmony. That's the vision that he offers. So, say 1968, uh, he's, 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 he's working on this, it's published in 1969. Um, it, in a sense, at this point, Hughes is still an eco warrior. He is thinking about questions of humankind and nature, thinking about how we relate to the planet, um, how we uh, relate to animals. But he's not engaged in practical action. 
But just before Easter 1970, as he was preparing um, his, uh, his great epic poem, Crow, for publication, he was asked to write a book review of a book called The Environmental Revolution. And this intervention heralded a highly important new direction in his work. The book was written by a man called Max Nicholson, who was formerly uh, the director of the British uh, government agency, the Nature Conservancy, the, equivalent, the British equivalent of the Environmental Protection Agency. And it was a history of the conservation movement. In his review, Hughes dated the modern awareness of impending ecological catastrophe to the publication in 1961 of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring that indictment of the effects of the pesticide DDT. And Hughes writes here with great authority about vanishing songbirds, the erosion of topsoil, the pollution of rivers, and the threat to biodiversity represented by the monoculture of the conifer plantations of the Forestry Com Commission. But in typical Hughesian vein, he places these scientific facts in the context of a much bigger picture a story about Western man's increasing alienation from nature. Christianity, he argues, especially in its Reformation version, its Protestant version, sees the earth as a heap of raw materials given by God to man for his exclusive use and profit. It has no time for creepy crawlies and little respect for women. This is Hughes. The subtly apotheosized misogyny of reformed Christianity is proportionate to the fanatic rejection of nature, and the result has been to exile man from mother nature, from both inner and outer nature. So here Hughes is pulling together several threads. The idea uh, derived from his studies in anthropology that human society has evolved from matriarchy to patriarchy. The narrative here developed out of Graves' Graves's white goddess, in which the fecund female earth goddess is displaced by quarrelsome male sky gods. And his reading, via Shakespeare and Milton, as well as, as Graves, of the Reformation and its suppression of the cult of the Virgin Mary. He finds hope at this point in the stirring of ecological consciousness, the emerging green movement, since it represents something, he says, writing in 1970, that was unthinkable only 10 years ago, except as a poetic dream, the re-emergence of nature as the great goddess of mankind and the mother of all life. And obviously there's a vein of thinking here that will, will tie into uh, some of the thinking around the whole Earth catalogue and the, the phenomenon of Gaia in the 1970s. Well, having published that review, along with some ecologically minded friends, Ted Hughes launched a magazine called Your Environment, which was intended to alert the public to questions of conservation. For example, the question of the disposal of nuclear waste. By gathering all the scientific evidence and making it accessible to a wide public, though with more rigour and detail than there was room for in the Sunday newspapers and in debates on radio and television. So this is the moment that Hughes begins to turn from eco-warrior into eco-warrior. And for the rest of his life, he pored over research papers, clipped out news stories, wrote to politicians and became involved in local environmental campaigns. His ecological mission was of a piece with his poetic vision. In that essay on the environmental revolution, he wrote of the mental disintegration and spiritual emptiness that characterized the soul state of our civilization. And that, in a way, is a very similar impulse to that of the Crow poems. But he also wrote of how the true artist, whom he describes as a mediumistic figure, like a medium, able, as it were, to converse with the dead, the true artist, he says, has the capacity to see a vision of the real Eden, to release the spirit of Pan, to restore humankind to nature. While the mice in the field are listening to the universe and moving in the body of nature, where every living cell is sacred to every other and all are interdependent, he rhapsodizes, 
The developer, the property developer that is, is peering at the field through a visor and behind him stands the whole army of madmen's ideas and shareholders impatient to cash in the world. Poet and conservationist, he believes, must unite and rise up against the spirit of the developer. He then, as it were, put his money where his mouth is. And in the course of the 1970s, he became a farmer. He and his second wife, Carol, uh, kept a farm in Dartmoor. And they tried uh, to farm, as we would now say, organically. Uh, they struggled financially. Um, but as a farmer poet, uh, the, his poetry of, of this period has a, 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 a kind of groundedness and unsentimentality, a, a real sense of uh, getting the hands dirty and bloody, uh, which means that he does not idealise nature in the way that so many poets through the centuries have. If one thinks of the, the traditions of pastoral poetry, the idealisation of the life of the farm, uh, Hughes is... is no soft pastoral, it's a hard pastoral. Uh, he wrote a, uh, a collection um, of, of, of poems in a kind of diary form about his time farming. At the, his farm was called Moortown, which is what the collection was called. Um, and among them, uh, there's a remarkable poem called February the 17th, um, uh, an unforgettably vivid account of the abortive birth of a lamb in which the only way uh, that he's able to save uh, a, a sheep uh, is by hacking off the head of the lamb. As I mentioned earlier, Hughes was also uh, an, an, an obsessive fisherman, um, and it was his interest in fishing that led him uh, to work in the late 1970s and early 1980s on one of his finest poetic uh, collections, uh, which was simply called River, um, a series of poems about river. But questions of river pollution become central in that collection. Uh, it was a, a volume uh, that was published with, uh, with photographs by a, a, another keen angler. Um, and uh, the, the, the origin of the volume has an interesting history, which I talk about in the biography, because uh, his publisher, Faber and Faber, said, well, uh, publishing uh, colored photographs in a book is, 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 is very expensive. We need a sponsor for it. Uh, so they initially uh, went out um, to see if the petrochemical giant Shell uh, would, be, would be willing to sponsor it as a, a Shell book of the river. Uh, as part of their, what we would now call their kind of corporate social responsibility, uh, Shell did publish uh, uh, a, a, a number of books about the environment. Um, that didn't work out, but then uh, they, they, they discovered um, that uh, British Gas, the, the nationalised um, gas utility, uh, company were, at the process, were in the process of laying gas pipelines across much of Britain because this was the time when North Sea oil um, had been discovered. Uh, and so um, uh, Ted Hughes found himself in conversations with the Public Relations Department at British Gas, who, who ended up sponsoring uh, the book and sort of paying for the photographs um, on condition uh, that um, a number of photographs were added which revealed the uh, ecological responsibility of British, British Gas's uh, uh, laying of the pipes. So among the captions to the photographs, we, we, we get this. The Scottish D has been called the river flowing out of paradise. A British gas pipeline crosses the D, crosses the D unseen and unheard at this point. Uh, and, and then again, against another a caption um, by a picture with a poem, a salmon, undisturbed by the large gas pipelines in the riverbed, moves in a pool on the River Don. British gas, in close consultation with the river authorities, has crossed many rivers in bringing the pipeline southwards. So he is perhaps a little uh, compromised there uh, in uh, the, 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 the manner in which the book was published. However, uh, uh, the volume River did also gain the support of the Countryside Commission, the, uh, uh, the, the, the non-government organisation that dealt with conservation. And so Ted felt that his conservationist credentials were honoured. In a letter written just after the book's publication, he noted that 20 years earlier, the Tor and Torridge rivers on which he fished and about which many of the poems are written, had produced a third of all the salmon caught in the West Country of England. But by his calculation, the catch on the Torridge in the last year was a mere 43 fish, whereas it used to be well over a thousand. The river, he said, had become a farm sewer. 
He had actually been writing those river poems uh, in conjunction with a campaign that he was involved in against a new sewage works in the nearby town of Biddeford. And local anglers took the lead in forming the Torridge Action Group and they planned legal action against the Southwest Water Authority. And Ted Hughes actually was their lead spokesman at the public inquiry um, objecting to uh, the sewage uh, plantation works. He marshaled an array of evidence and produced charts showing the decline in catches uh, to reports from local doctors um, about the, uh, the, the, the effect of the sewage work on, on, on local residents. So an example there of Hughes uh, engaging in a, a local campaign. And so it was that once he became Poet Laureate uh, in 1984, after the death of John Betjeman, he suddenly had a public platform. A poet had a voice in national discourse, an ability to make things happen. And uh, I want to close uh, with um, a, a segment um, of my book where I describe uh, uh, some, some of the things that he did as, uh, in which he was, uh, as I would put it, the poet laureate as eco-warrior. So I'm going to read for about five minutes now and then there'll be time for, for questions. On the 4th of June, 1987, just over a week before the general election in which Margaret Thatcher coasted to her third successive term as Prime Minister, Ted Hughes published what he called an ecological dialogue in the Times newspaper. It was headed First Things First, and it was subtitled An Election Duet Performed in the Womb by Fetal Twins. It blamed man's headlong obsession with economic growth and more particularly, the policies of Western governments and the regulations of the European Economic Community for a mountain of wasted butter, for contaminated tap water, leukemia brought on by pesticides sprayed on grain fields, and even the phenomenon of cot death. The price of increasing the gross national product, he argued, was leafless trees, rivers without fish, and human beings suffering from pre-senile dementia. The poem begins in loose iambic pentameter and ends in brisk rhyming trimeter, but it contains in the middle the two longest and perhaps least poetic lines of verse that Hughes ever wrote, but they are interestingly polemical. This is, this is like Walt Whitman on overdrive, these two lines I'm about to read. And if the cost of annual expansion of the world chemical industry taken as a whole over the last two decades is a 40% drop in the sperm count of all human males, nor can God alone help the ozone layer or the, ovum, or the ovum, then let what can't be sold to your brother and sister be released on the third world and let it return by air and sea to drip down the back of your own throat at night. Oh. He explained to a fellow poet, that pollution was the great theme of the age. He had noticed, judging children's poetry competitions, which he often did, how it was something that even six and seven-year-olds were worrying about. The poem, he explained, was inspired by his reading of a book called The Poisoned Womb, hu Human Reproduction in a Polluted World, by a, 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 a biologist called John Elkington, who was a, something of a preacher of eco-apocalypse. Uh, who speculated that toxins were causing a massive reduction in human fertility. Hughes was particularly uh, troubled by the way that the, the, there was evidence of fish changing gender as a result of, 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 of pollution. He did not have any faith in Margaret Thatcher's willingness to address the question. For one thing, her husband Dennis was involved in the waste disposal trade, and for another, he said, she was the sort of woman upon whom nothing could put the frighteners. She resembled an army commander who believed that he could afford a casualty rate of 25%. Her intransigence, he thought, was ironic since she had an Oxford degree in chemistry. But perhaps, he said, it was not surprising. As prime minister, she would listen only to professional consultants with vested interests. Besides, when she had been a practicing chemist before becoming a politician, her job had merely been to research the maximum number of bubbles that can be pumped into ice cream before it disillusions the customers. <laughs> a fact about Mrs. Thatcher that I didn't know before discovering it in Ted Hughes. 
Ted at this time was worried by bubbles of another kind. One of his fishing friends lived in a house on the River X and had observed a white foam boiling up on the weir where he fished. There was a sewage works a little way upstream. He would eventually bring another civil case against the Water Authority. And Ted offered his usual support. The headline in the, no in, in the local newspaper read, Top Poet in Water Fight. Inspired by Ted, his fishing friend and his lawyer dramatically invoked the rites enshrined in the Magna Carta. The judge, perhaps getting into the poetic spirit of things, compared the relevant stretch of, witter, of river to the face of a beautiful woman scarred by disease, the kind of metaphor Ted would rather have liked. And against expectation, uh, the fishermen won their case. And Ted Hughes told the press it was a historic victory because it had reactivated the power of the common law in this terrific issue of water quality in rivers. And then I think very, very nobly, instead of seeking damages, uh, his, his fishing friend Ian Cook asked the Water Authority uh, to contribute to the research of the Institute of Freshwater Ecology into the polluting effects of detergents um, in, in the X. And that established uh, a connection uh, between Ted Hughes and the ecotoxicologist John Sumpner, who was working on that phenomenon of, of how endocrine disruptors are ca were causing male fish to change gender. Well, that ecological dialogue during the, the 1987 election campaign and the court case against the Southwest Water are just two of the many instances in which Hughes used his public profile as poet laureate to address environmental concerns. Whether it was ammonia in the River Torridge, a proposal to establish a Tarka the Otter Trail that risked disrupting the fragile ecosystem of the riverbank, an amusement park beside a river in his native Yorkshire, or an international campaign to save the black rhinoceros, he was always ready to pen a protest. And he always made it clear that his concern for the natural world was also concern for humankind. He did so most forcefully, forcefully in an interview on the occasion of the publication of his most overtly ecological children's fable, The Iron Woman, a sequel to The Iron Man. There he said that most people tend to, to defend or to rationalize the pollution of water. The general assumption was that environmentalists were merely defending fish or insects or flowers. I mean, how often is this said about environmentalists in the States today? Merely defending fish or insects or flowers. I was sit sitting next to a businessman on my, te uh, on, on my flight from, from Texas into Arizona uh, who, told, he, who said to me, uh, uh, we can't do anything in this country because we have a lame duck president who even believes in the rights of centipedes. And I kind of wanted to say to him that uh, Ted Hughes would have had some interesting things to say about the rights of centipedes. But Hughes's point here is that to, to dismiss environmentalism as merely defending fish or insects or flowers misses the point that, as he puts it, the effects on otters and so on are indicators of what is happening to us. The issue is not so much to look after the birds and bees as to ferry human beings through the next century. The danger, he writes, is multiplied through each generation. We don't really know what bomb has already been planted in the human system. So with the Cold War at an end, the old image of the fear of nuclear annihilation that had underlain many of his earlier poems, and indeed some of Plath's, was translated into fear of global ecocide. Such was the life of the poet laureate as eco-warrior. He always enjoyed describing his environmental discoveries and interventions in lengthy letters to his son, Nicholas, his beloved son, uh, who studied uh, biology at Oxford and uh, then went to become uh, an extremely distinguished um, professor of freshwater ecology at the University of Fairbanks in Alaska. Ted Hughes was also very good at providing long-distance paternal advice to his son, Nick. When Nick broke up with his long-term girlfriend, Ted comforted him with the story uh, of his own life, oscillating, as he put it, between fierce relationships that become tunnel traps and sudden escapes into wide freedom when the whole world seems to be just there for the taking. 
It's a letter of extraordinary beauty, wisdom, and tenderness you can find in the selected letters of Ted Hughes, which tells of the inner child within us, going back to that figure of the child in the Iron Man, and the paradox, as Hughes puts it, that the only time most people feel alive is when they're suffering, when something overwhelms their ordinary, careful armour, and the naked child is flung out into the world. There is a key there to the source of the cathartic power of poetry. That's why the things that are worst to undergo are best to remember, Hughes writes. And then he concludes, and this is a moment where I think his ecological consciousness merges uh, with his human compassion. This, he says, is how we measure our real respect for people by the degree of feeling they can register, the voltage of life they can carry and tolerate and enjoy. And it seems to me the greatness of Hughes as a thinker and as a poet is precisely in the degree of feeling, both for humans but also for the planet, that he does register, the voltage of life that he carries in his work. He then says, in typically self-deprecating way, end of sermon. As Buddha says, live like a mighty river. Thank you.